Monsieur le ministre, cher Clément Bonne, Frau Staatssekretärin, liebe Franziska Brandner, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, cher François Delattre, Madame l'Ambassadeur, cher Veronika Van Danielsen, Ladies and Gentlemen, Faculty, Staff and Students. My name is Cornelia Woll, and I'm the president of the Hattie School. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to our Henrik Enderlein Forum to hear two very distinguished speakers talk about the path to a greener and stronger Europe. We are truly honored that Clément Boone, France's Minister of Transport, has taken time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. As Minister of Transport since July 2022, he oversees an incredibly rich and dense portfolio and has been a strong advocate for greener mobility with a focus on European initiatives. This has included a recent proposal for a minimum price on European flights and launching an initiative with the German Transport Ministry to give away 60,000 train tickets to young French and German people in honor of the 60th anniversary of the Élysée Treaty. His support of European integration is much deeper than just this current mandate. Prior to his work in the Ministry of Ecological Transition and Territorial Cohesion, he has steered the French presidency of the EU Council as Deputy Minister for Europe in the French Foreign Office in the spring of 2022. And for those of you who don't remember, remember that was an election period. So to steer the French president during an election time was clearly a task that required a lot of able um, leadership. I will also point out his role as special advisor for Europe to the French president, and in many ways, the mastermind of President Emmanuel Macron's European initiatives, starting with the visionary Sorbonne speech delivered in 2017. Now, this speech is often cited as the origin of the vision for strategic autonomy of Europe, but I would like to refer to it because it is crucial for us here at the Hattie School as one of the initiatives, and I will attribute you the paternity or the partial paternity, to something we have spent hours trying to bring to life, European universities. In 2019, the Hattie School became part of one of these European university alliances with Civica, which joins us together with nine other European partner universities in the social sciences, with Sciences Po, in Paris, with the Stockholm School of Economics, with the London School of Economics, or the Warsaw School of Economics, and the European um, University Institute in Florence and others. We're very proud to be part of this alliance, and it is a testament to the conviction that if we forge alliances across Europe and we ensure that we connect our students, our faculty, our staff, we're contributing to building a stronger Europe and to bringing it to life at the individual level. So for this, dear Clément Bonne, the Hattie School owes you deep gratitude. And because we gathered here today in the Henrik Enderlein Forum, I would like to add another note of thanks. Together with Minister Anna Luermann, Clément Bonne initiated the Henrik Enderlein Prize for Research Excellence in the Social Sciences to commemorate the late former president, Henrik Enderlein, by honoring a young researcher who shares Henrik's dedication to research at the service of society. It was through Clément Bonn's incredible persistence that this prize came into being and is now going into its third year. Thank you so much, Clément, for your support to celebrate Henrik's life and work here every year. Now, following the first keynote from Clément Bonn, we will hear from Dr. Franziska Brandner, Parliamentary State Secretary in the German Min Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Among her many responsibilities, she's the special representative of the German government for implementing the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative in Germany. Prior to this role, she was the European Affairs Spokesperson and Parliamentary Secretary for the Greens Parliamentary Group and served as a member of the European Parliament from 2009 to 2013. We're also very grateful here at the Hattie School to be the recipient of Franziska Brandner's advice through the many years you have spent as a member of our Board of Trustees. I could not think of two better speakers to discuss the intersection of the green transition, economic growth, and European integration today. And this is not the first time you've met. Now, of course, you've met politically, but I think few people in the room know that you have known one another for 23 years. And 23 years is a long time. You met as political science students in Sciences Po in the early 2000s, where you studied core theories of European integration, like some of us in the room here are still doing. And I'm mentioning this because now, years later, 
you are constructing Europe together. And to me, this story illustrates two very important points. The first is the crucial role universities play in the European project. Frequently, academia is portrayed as this ivory tower where researchers talk to one another, but to nobody else in some incomprehensible jargon. But in reality, universities are places where people get in touch with ideas and political initiatives, where students meet and where we're able to train and talk with the next generation of decision makers who will drive politics forward. And this can go very well across borders and across complicated issue areas, as your work has demonstrated. And I would like to make a second point by focusing in more specifically on the Franco-German relationship. In recent years, or maybe actually as long as I can remember, there's been much ado about the Franco-German couple not being well, with analysts and journalists calling it under stress, strained or even dead. Nobody has said brain dead yet, but we're getting there. There's always questions about how well we are doing. And Clément Bon and Francisca Brandner's collaboration over the years has so, shown, excuse me, shown just the opposite. The crucial work the two of you are doing as part of the motor that we call the Franco-German engine is, I think, more relevant than some of the superficial spats we can see at the more politically visible levels of government. And I'm really confident that with the amount of enthusiasm and drive you bring to your work, we are moving into a stronger Europe with a very healthy Franco-German collaboration at its heart, and I'd like to thank you for that. The topic of today's event, the green transition, is one of the areas that makes the necessity and the urgency of greater European cooperation self-evident. The only way that we will be able to tackle the challenges that climate change poses is together, as are all the geopolitical challenges that we're facing. And creating ambitious programs and enacting measures to reduce emissions and make a green future possible really has to be a joint enterprise. So allow me in closing to thank the colleagues who made today's event possible. We truly appreciate the cooperation with the French Ministry for Transport, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, as well as the French Embassy. Philip Jäger, a fellow of our Jacques Delors Center, not only graciously agreed to moderate this evening's event, but also provided his input in all the content and coordination as we were preparing. Philip Jäger is um, an expert of European climate and economic policy, an area he has worked on as an economic and policy analyst for the EU Commission, in particular on the recovery and resilience facility. In this and also during his studies at the LSE, where he holds a master in economics at Bayreuth, Harvard and Berkeley. So a big thank you for all the work in the uh, um, preparation. And last but not least, I would really like to mention our communications department and Tuha Dank, together with the communications team that is making sure today's event runs as smooth as possible. Now, please join me in welcoming our first keynote speaker of the evening, Clément Bohm. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Madam President, dear Cornelia, dear Minister de Francisca, ambassadors, dear students. I'm uh, very happy and moved to be here tonight. Um, first, because I want to, uh, of course, say words in the memory of Hendrik. And also because uh, it feels a bit strange to be in a university in front of uh, much younger students than us now, Francisca. Uh, <laughs> to still meet you and see you in different positions as when we were sitting on benches like you now, uh, but to still be friends and to still work together. And I think not to have changed so much, even if we don't belong to the same, to, exact, to the exact same political families, but to, I think, be true to our convictions, uh, values, and European fights. Um, we are at the age now when we pass messages to the younger generation, so we will try to not to be too long, to be concrete, and to be on the same line as much as possible, but still debating because it's a bit more lively. I also want to say, Cornelia, a word because we are doing this uh, discussion and these speeches uh, nearly six years after the Sorbonne speech. I will not make the Sorbonne speech on the equivalent of a Sorbonne speech tonight. It would be far too long. But uh, I just want to insist that one of the achievements that I'm most proud of, if you allow me to be 
a bit uh, less humble than I should be, uh, is European universities, as you said, uh, because it's good to see that first when you have uh, an idea on paper, it can become reality, even when it's an EU idea. And uh, it's good to see that uh, it can be a useful idea as well, very concrete and making cooperation between universities, which of course is a long history for our continent, but even closer, this ever closer union is true for universities and you are a key player in this. So I wanted to thank you and to say I'm also quite moved to see this in our reality and this helps bringing together students, researchers, academics and ideas. I uh, will start with climate and extend with Europe, but on climate I'm sure that Francisca will be much more expert than I am. Just to say a few words, I started my visit in Berlin yesterday afternoon by meeting a different community, the business community in a trilateral format of uh, corporates from Germany, France, Italy. And I heard a lot, and we were at Francisca on our European tour in Evian together uh, a couple of weeks ago. I will not say a lot because it's Chatham House rules. Uh, but I had the same feeling, and I'm sure you had, uh, that our businesses are very worried about energy policy, climate transition, which I may understand. But they go a step further, and sometimes, and I can still understand, but a bit less, they are very critical of the Green Deal at the EU level. Uh, I think we are both, Tia Francisca, very committed to this European climate agenda and green agenda. But what I say to businesses, and I'm, of course, less, less knowledgeable than each of them in their technical area, energy, chemicals, car industry, and so on, just think that on a political and strategic level, if we don't have the European Green Deal, either we have nothing, which I think, especially for your generation, would be a catastrophe, or we have 27 Green Deals, because we will have regulation in France, in Germany, in Sweden, in Netherlands, and so on and so forth. I think for no business, not to say for the public and our generation and the next generation, having 27 different climate policies would be another disaster. So we could discuss and we should discuss on the pace, the substance, the technical content of the Green Deal. We should prepare, I think, much better than we did, to be very frank, with much better coordination between France and Germany, the next step for European elections and the next EU institutions, for sure. But as we say, don't shoot the messenger, don't shoot the Green Deal. Because the EU level is the right level to be effective and efficient regarding climate transition. And we should see the difficulties and the challenges, of course. But let's, let's just imagine that four years ago, just four years ago, the new commission took office. Not even four years ago, actually. And the first package which was put on the table was the Green Deal, which was quite visionary. I must say, of course, the climate issue was there already. But to make it a key priority of the European Commission, I think was absolutely necessary and vital. And when you look at the decisions which were made, in this window of four years, it is impressive. It is impressive. When we say in our public debate, in the French debate, what have you done for greening, for the green transition, for the climate agenda? Say, okay, I will explain what we are deciding in the national parliament and so on, but first look at what happened in Brussels and Strasbourg. Because when we decided at the EU level to ban in less than 15 years, in 12 years, Thermical cars all over the continent, 450 million people, nearly as many car drivers, 27 countries. It was unsinkable a few years ago. And this is probably one of the most powerful green decisions we have made. If we had made it at the German level, French level, Spanish level, whatever, that would be far less powerful in terms of green impacts and totally crazy in terms of industrial strategy. So, I will not go through the 75, I think, text of the Green Deal, be reassured, but I want to insist on that. If we want to be green, you have to be European. There's no alternative to that. And then the discussion starts, but there's no alternative to that. And I say that because it will be, on a more political note, one of the key debates and probably dividing lines of the next, dividing lines, sorry, of the next European elections. And we see now that populism is taking even more than the migration issue, the climate issue. We should take it seriously because the, question, the questions raised are serious. How we make sure that 
everybody in society has a place in the green transition, how we make sure that people who are at the same time necessity to use their cars at this very moment and have low revenues and low income have a solution in terms of buying an electric car, of having public transport. And we are all in different manners at the local, national, European level facing this huge transition and transformation. But we should not leave it aside. And we should not leave it aside at the EU level. And I think it's also in the interests of corporates, of businesses, and of course, of the public and the young generation in particular. I extend to the European debate because I think it's a clear illustration that all the challenges we are facing at the EU level, sorry to be that obvious, are external and global challenges. It may seem natural, it may seem evident, but it is quite new. And I always insist on that, talking to students and talking to the younger generation, do not forget that when the EU was created, I assure you, Francisca and myself, we are not there. We are not that old, uh, but we studied together and we learned together. Uh, the generation, the initial generation, the project was all inward looking. The project was all about making things together within the continent. And at the beginning, within a small club of six countries extending, and this is also a big EU success. And that's, that has to be recalled because everything was about first reconciling France and Germany, the two neighbors which had fought each other for nearly a century. And then to bring them in a wider club, Italy, Benelux and so on, and going on. But all the policies were built on this idea that we had to put together countries which had been fighting together. Cooperation before power and cooperation and no power, to be frank. As I sometimes say, we were vaccinated, if I may say, against power in the EU or the European community at the very beginning, because we had the thinking that power had been used against each other and destroyed the whole continent for decades. So we built very successfully a club of cooperation, a club of domestic and internal policies, bigger and bigger, now 27 countries. We were sometimes ago 28, uh, and we will probably be more in the near future. And we should keep that cooperation spirit and in a way inward looking spirit. But we have to combine it. Probably we never succeeded in two to three centuries at least with power and geopolitics. I was this morning taking part in a panel at the Berlin Global Dialogue. It was all about geopolitics. And I say it's funny because geopolitics was probably an academic topic five years ago, 10 years ago. Now it's everywhere in politics and the public debate. Maybe we don't exactly know what it means, but we hear it and we feel it's here. Interestingly, the previous European Commission, the Juncker Commission in 2014, started with a very powerful uh, statement. It will be a political commission, said Jean-Claude Juncker at the time. And when Ursula von der Leyen took office five years later, she said, my commission is a geopolitical commission. I must admit, I was, I think, part of the people who work on the motto. Uh, but I think it was a good motto, not just because we worked on it, but because it says something. And this was before COVID. And this was before the war in Ukraine at the moment. Because everything is at least European, not to say global for sure. Climate change and the policies we need to fight climate change. Migration issue, very interestingly, and no controversy in what I'm saying, but because I know there are some debates here, as we have, some debates between this country and uh, a southern neighbor, as we have. Uh, but for sure, even the nationalist, the nationalist parties, when they're in office, then say after a few months, after saying we'll close the borders, close the harbors and so on, we want European solidarity. You owe us European solidarity, which is true. But it's good to say that it was a shift in their approach. And to recall that to populist parties which are flourishing all over the place. Same with digital transformation. Can, do you imagine that there could be a German agenda for digital regulation or a French agenda for digital regulation? No sense. So I will not go through the whole list of the global challenges which you all know very well and which are again in your everyday life and very obvious. But we all know now that geopolitics matter. We see it in the price of oil, we see it in inflation, we see that when there is war and post-COVID economic consequences, it has an impact on your everyday life. Uh, 
And we also know that Europe has to combine this inward looking DNA of cooperation, which is a success and we should definitely not lose, with this ability to be together a pole. It's not the French idea of Europe puissance repainted, don't worry. Uh, but I think we all somehow believe in that now, all across the continent. And if we needed a wake-up call, of course, the aggression of Russia in Ukraine was a terrible wake-up call, but it has also demonstrated, we should be proud of that, if I may say, that Europe was able to react. Let's not underestimate it, just like COVID, in a few days, powerfully. Of course, without military support from the US, the situation would be very different in Ukraine, let's be far, let's be honest. But we are doing our part on the big part. We were able to do sanctions by unanimity. In the end, eventually, each package passed. We were able to say in one weekend, we will close airspace in all our countries to Russian flights. We closed, which is in democracy, something rare, fortunately, and very extraordinary in a way, but we closed media from Russia because they had become war media all over the continent and all over the EU. And package after package, we are supporting in a civilian and military matter beyond our different geopolitical traditions, Ukraine. And even France is now pushing for enlargement to Ukraine first, but also to the Balkans. And I'm proud of it. So we have changed, and I think we have converged. Of course, I don't want to sound naive or over-optimistic, because you hear, you read every day that it is difficult between France and Germany, that it is difficult in the EU. And let me be honest, it is. But I always insist on that when I have the opportunity to do a debate like this. When you see difficulties in the French-German relation, when you see difficulties at the EU table, First, this is normal. This was created for that. Before we had a different mode of regulating our conflicts, I think sending and throwing directives or articles of regulations at each other is a better way to do the conflict. So let's cherish it because it's important. Second, it's always been difficult even in this nice area of legal disputes. Uh, Against Again, Francisca and myself were not there from the beginning, but we know that even when you don't look back at Monet, Schumann, Adenauer, or Gasperi, just look back at three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, you can pick at least ten topics on which it was as difficult as today regarding energy or defense and security, which are per se difficult topics. And we made it. So it's not automatic. You have to fight for a compromise, to fight for a deal, to fight for a solution. It's never given. But it is possible, and usually it happens. The best example, I just mentioned briefly COVID, as a good example of European reaction. But here again, let's be frank, at the beginning, it was a disaster. I remember the first weeks of discussion, if I may call it discussion, between EU countries through video conferences, because we had not even diplomatic summits and meeting points, it was nearly insults flying at each other because the situation was so tense, so difficult from a human point of view, the health point of view, we had no health policy, no habits of having a European, a European economic response to such a crisis that we were in a very, very bad situation, much worse than now. And we made it, dear Veronica, former ambassador of Sweden to France before being now in Germany through Stockholm. Uh, you remember, sorry to mention it, but I think it's a good and concrete example. There were discussions over the phone between the Swedish prime minister, then Mr. Leuven and President Macron, Swedish prime minister saying, you have our masks. We ordered masks and you are closing the border. You are taking our masks. And President Macron said, okay, we will release the masks. But it was just to say, how crazy the situation was. Even, to be honest, between France and Germany, there were border closures. So it is fragile, but it is always possible to find a solution. And after a few weeks, not even months, a few weeks, realizing how bad the situation had been, we understood that we had no solutions and to get back to the room, concretely speaking, we went back to a room, not only VTCs, and we found solutions. And after a very nasty spring, in July 2020 already, this is extraordinary, we got a huge recovery package and we bought our vaccines together 
which was a crazy idea, to be frank, but a positive crazy idea. So we need your ideas. We need your optimism. We need your belief in the fact that it is possible. When you look at Francisca and myself, after 23 years, we're still able to have drinks together. I'm even ready to have beers and you have good wine. Uh, but we are, I think, a good example of a true and lasting friendship between France and Germany, but beyond our nice couple, I may say. Uh, just believe that this starts with this concrete achievements, these concrete discussions, and especially in universities and in the academic world. Not saying it's to close the circle, if I may say, but it is necessary each time we have difficulties even more to move to concrete projects, to move to the young generation, and to recall that if you study together, if you do Erasmus, usually you don't vote far right or even far left. I think, sorry to say that. And whenever there is a problem, we had the, the question when we made the celebration 60th anniversary of the Elysee Treaty, I'm not saying that because I'm now transport minister, but we said, okay, let's do as we did 60 years ago when De Gaulle and Adenauer had a very short, and I invite you to read it because it's worth it, a very short and very concrete treaty between France and Germany. They started with use, they started with freedom of movement, and they started with concrete cooperation. It was not called Erasmus, but it was the first university and youth exchanges called Ophage in French, and it still exists. And we started, and we decided, sorry, to go on with this idea of a rail pass. We now are even inspired by Germany to have our own 49 euro rail pass in the coming months, so we are taking good ideas from each other, and we will move on like that. So don't think it's difficult. It was much more difficult when the European project was created. It was much more difficult to have examples all over the place five, 10, 20 years ago from time to time. But we need you, we need your energy, we need a frank debate. And I think that's what it is about tonight. So we would be happy to answer your questions after my friend Francisca has also delivered this keynote. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Clément. <laughs> um, dear Cornelia, uh, thanks for hosting this, dear uh, François Ambassador, dear new Swedish Ambassador, it's a pleasure meeting you. Um, cher Clément, everybody, uh, thanks for being here. And if I may say also for me, it's a special moment to be here in the Henrik Enderlein Forum with a dear friend and a real uh, Franco-Allemand and a real European. And we uh, miss him dearly every day. Um, because of his uh, work, his understanding between our two countries. And he, he, you know, he would have had a lot to say on sustainable growth and a stronger Europe. And some, sometimes when we think through and how can we advance something, I, I think by myself, so what would Henrik have said? Um, and I think it helps to, um, to go back to his, his uh, thinking. And as you said, uh, you know, Clément, I, I think we... We owe a lot to what generations before us have built in terms of our the way of life we were allowed to have. You were spending an Erasmus year in Ireland. Um, I was in one of those uh, German-French schools that were created by the Elysee Treaty, uh, so which only existed because leaders had agreed to create joint schools, uh, which had then allowed me to go and directly study in Paris. Uh, and I think we had already all of these opportunities because people before us were daring to make the bridge and to not see the other as an enemy, but to see them as a friend uh, with always knowing that there are complications and difficulties, but the goal is to make them into, turn them into something important and useful. And if you allow me, you have put here sustainable growth and a stronger Europe. I think it's always important to think back about what Europe is. It's in the first place, as Clément just said, it's an inward looking but important peace project. Uh, and for me, I have always been advocating, and I know Clément has been doing the same. I remember we were campaigning together on a 2005 referendum in France, for example, 
yeah, you know, these were difficult times. I remember we were, you know, together, um, standing in the streets, trying to convince French people to, um, you know, to vote in favor of the European Union. And people, when we were saying it's a peace project, they were like, ah, you know, peace is so 20th century. We don't need to work on, on a peace project. And I often say, you know, look really into this world, Ukraine. Um, we have to remember that from here, Ukraine is closer than Paris in terms of kilometer wise. It's not far. It's really on our continent that we're having a war again. Uh, and I think, you know, it's uh, when you see somehow how they try to fight against uh, our democratic institutions, how they fight against the EU, we have to be careful on what we uh, wish for. And if I hear some leaders, you know, also in communities or in business communities saying, scrap the EU, I would say, watch out what you wish for. The internal market is in the end, it's our lifeline uh, for, our, for our peace, but also for our wealth and our well-being inside the European Union. So it is about peace, and peace today has this other external dimension, which is the strength, the powerful. It's the question of resilience and being able to act. That's what we call at the European level, as, you know, some call it autonomy, we call it strategic sovereignty. But I think that we have seen quite a shift in the last couple of years on both sides, on converging on the concept of, you might call it geopolitics, but to agree that we need to have that dimension of strategic sovereignty within the European Union and to make that an essential part of what the European Union is there for. And I think that was a big shift also on the German side, um, but it was also a big shift on the French side to accept it's not about French Europe puissance being the same as French puissance, um, and for us to be accepting that we do this and do not at the same time, you know, abandon our transatlantic partnership in Germany was for long debated as either or. You either do European sovereignty or you do transatlantic relationship. And I think the big shift we made in Germany is to realize it's not either or, um, but that we have to work on both. And I think in that sense, the last couple of years have actually quite made a difference in allowing us to think it through and this is the challenge we are facing also when we talk about uh, energy, which is a key part of uh, climate, is that we have come to see that energy is um, a key part of our security, of our sovereignty. Uh, we have had a, to learn at the hard lesson in Germany. We were warned by other Europeans, France including, often very diplomatic, not very out loud voiced. Uh, I know it was always very diplomatic in the news, um, but we had much clearer voices from, you know, Lithuania, Poland, etc. And I think uh, that we have come to understood that we do not just have to get out of the fossil fuels for the saving of our planet, but also for our own security. And I think that has been part of um, the promulgation of also the Green Deal over the last years, because many were saying when the war in Ukraine started, the Green Deal is dead. Um, and not just us, but others also came to the other conclusion that the Green Deal is ever more important because it helps towards sustainable growth, but it also makes us stronger as Europe because we do not want to be dependent on autocrats wherever they sit for getting their fossil energy. And I think that has um, been an issue we have been trying to communicate uh, on the Green Deal, but I think that economic security aspect of the Green Deal is important to keep in mind. It's really for us an essential part of the Green Deal is to also increase our own strategic sovereignty, if I may say so, when it comes to energy. And there comes the second part when it comes to our industrial base. Um, so the Green Deal is for us exactly at the heart of both sustainable growth and a stronger and resilient Europe. Uh, allow me to give to say a few words about this in detail because I think it's important to understand. Um, we have in Germany the debate, and you mentioned the car debate, um, as if we were still in a world where we could define what the future will be as if we could define how the future of the car would look like, as if we could define how the heating pumps of the future would look like. 
And the real situation is that if we believe we can just keep the status quo, we will not just harm the climate, but we will lose our jobs. That's the basic rationale. And it's hard to say that, to say, we have built up all of this wealth in Germany, built on these technologies, and now we have to move on to safeguard the wealth of the next generations. But it is really about our wealth in Europe, also in Germany. And I sometimes think it's a bit of, um, you know, classically in English and political science, you call this the, being the victim of your own successes. And I think that's part of why it's so difficult also in Germany, because we have been so successful with that. We have been able to you know, get very rich over the last couple of decades, expanding, selling our cars, um, and making sure that we are the best in that category. And it's hard to realize at one point that others are as, as well advancing with the new technology. Um, and to accept that others are there as well and that our own success, what has made us so strong, has come under pressure and that we need to innovate. Uh, and the same is true when it comes to our model as such of cheap gas import from Russia or cheap Chinese imports for our supply chains, which has been a huge success story for Germany. It has made us very, very rich. And to understand that this, what made us so successful and so rich is now a risk factor, it's hard to accept. Um, and it's hard to turn it over. It's much easier if you are in a failing position and you have totally failed, and then you know you can easily, more easily change than when uh, it has been your way of success for decades. But I think we're getting there, and that we're much better able at doing this together as Europeans, because in the end, it's not about Germany or France and the big world, but it's about Europeans doing this together. Um, and I think what we can also use this new Green Deal for when we talk about sustainable growth and a stronger Europe is that it allows us to restructure our partnerships with countries outside the EU. I just said we have been very dependent when we spoke in the past about globalization. It was basically integrating China into the global supply chains, plus a few other countries. It was not about Africa. It was not about Latin America. So it was never really global. It was, you know, some regions, but many others were not part of the global supply chain. Uh, they were never part of it. Uh, and now I think with the Green Deal, with the new technologies, we have an opportunity to really build green, resilient supply chains with many countries of this world, with Latin America, with African states, with some others in Asia, and with all partners like Australia, Canada, that we rediscover as important friends and allies in this world, Japan as well. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for us to say, look, there will be new supply chains for the electrolyzers, for the cars, for the solar panels, for hydrogen, for circular economy. There will be new technologies, new supply chains. And we have the opportunity now to build them up on a different value base, on an equal partnership, where we create value in, in our partner countries back home. And they will be much more resilient. They will be greener. They will be respectful of the environment. And they will allow us to be also more resilient in Europe. And I think that's a big opportunity we have when we speak about geopolitical Europe, is to use that green momentum for reaching out to new partners. And luckily, we see that many actually are interested. Uh, many countries, I spoke again now to, um, you know, be it Chile or this afternoon with some, you know, in Zambia, Namibia, they actually would love to build those green supply chains on hydrogen, on green minerals, on lithium, on copper, on cobalt. There is the will to work together with us. And we can only embrace it if we embrace the Green Deal really wholeheartedly and invest in it. Because otherwise, we will leave that space to the Chinese. And then in a couple of years, we will be sitting there and being again, oh my god, uh, why did we miss that opportunity? But it's only possible if we embrace ourselves, the Green Deal, as an opportunity for economic growth and for more security. Uh, we have the same on the digital side, uh, and I think you know we we have to be very careful on on thinking sometimes, even though we hate thinking about it, 
about the Trump II scenario and what that would mean for us in the digital area. When you see some of the economic advisors in that circle around um, Trump speaking about Europe and the first thing you know, is to leave NATO, I'm like that has an obvious risk for us when it comes to Ukraine, but they also sometimes speak about you know, all the clouds, everything. Um, so that is a risk I say we have to also sometimes think about at least, even though we cherish our current partnership with the Biden administration because it's better than you no know, one could ever have expected. But it's not without, uh, unfortunately, uh, the risk of taking uh, another road in the US as well. So we have to keep that climate agenda because it serves our climate goals, but also because it makes us more resilient and because it helps us to build our networks worldwide so that we will not be alone and without friends. And I think that is part of what we can achieve. And I uh, hope that we will be able to make that transformation in a democratic way. That's the major challenge, to save that uh, democratic space for debate on what the transformation. And it's hard these days. We have that in Germany. We have it in France. We have so many fake news in this area. It's scary. We know where it comes from. We know who finances it. Um, and these are not friends of democracy. Uh, so I think we have to understand that the fight against the climate agenda is also a fight against the EU and the fight against democracy. It's the same people, it's the same money, it's the same origin. So let's make sure that we do not divide over these issues and say the one, the one side fights for Europe, the other side fights for climate, the other side fight for democracy. The enemy is the same. So let's make this a joint fight. I think it's the only way that we can win and get into a much more sustainable and healthy and resilient Europe. And we count on you, of course, um, to help us on this way. There are many ways that we can go it. There are debates that we can have. But I think to have that in mind it will be important over the next couple of months and years, which will certainly be difficult. And uh, if I may say, I do remember we had Valérie Giscard d'Estaing at the time um, at Sciences Po for the European Convention. Um, and he was of the generation that still you know, could well remember. And he always told us, you know, be as daring, as daring as those who, are, who dare to think peace between Germany and France. And I think that's you know, what always kept in my mind, that th these people at the time, they were much more daring than us to think the end of the combustion engine. Thank you. To this work, yeah. Uh, good evening also from my side. Uh, I'm Philip Jäger. I work here at the Jacques Delors Center of the Hertie School. I'm uh, very much looking forward to uh, moderating the, the debate and going a little bit deeper into the points you raised during your, your keynotes. Um, but this event is also for you, and I want to reserve quite a bit of time uh, for questions from the audience uh, at the end. So uh, yeah, th think about what you want to ask, and I'm afraid we won't be able to call on everyone, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, involve you as much as possible. Um, to kick us off, I would like to start uh, with something that you already mentioned uh, in, your, in your keynotes, namely the ambition of the Green Deal in the next couple of years. And as you mentioned in, in your keynote, I think it's quite impressive what came out of Brussels in the last couple of years with regards to climate ambition. Uh, but now we are in a phase where we have to turn from just setting those targets um, to actually implementing measures. So we need to build uh, solar and wind farms, we have to renovate houses, we need to change the way uh, our mobility system works. And I think now it's becoming increasingly clear that certain parts of the populations are a little bit hesitant with shouldering these, these costs and these, uh, these changes. And so they might say, oh, I'm in favor of uh, tackling climate change, but not if it means that I have to pay more for filling up my gas tank for my car or renovate my house and so on. And uh, I think in, in Germany, this became evident in recent months with the heating law uh, and the potential banning of gas boilers. In France, everyone is uh, still aware of the yellow vest uh, movement uh, over high gasoline prices. Uh, so I'd be interested in your assessment of those political dynamics in Europe over the next couple of years and whether we should 
push ahead with being ambitious on targets and implementing those targets, or whether it would be smarter to slow down in a few areas um, in order to ensure that there's widespread support from uh, society. Um, perhaps uh, Ms. Brandner starts and then. No, thank you for that question. I think it's a key, uh, key question. The problem with the climate crisis is that if you slow down, you will have next generations that have to be faster and even more radical. So basically, you postpone the difficulties to you. <laughs> you know, so I could say, okay, whatever, up to you guys. But it will be more difficult for you. So I think it would be in a way irresponsible. Um, and I don't think that this uh, is a discussion or should be a discussion about slowliness but about how we do it. Um, and talking about the heat law, evidently I think we should have made it clearer from the beginning, and, and I think that was a, you know, a difficulty in the communication, um, that you don't get your heating pump out if it's still functioning. So that was, you know, oh, so many were saying they will come and so take you your... You, you said the heating pump, but you meant the uh, gas. The, the gas, you know, that, you know, evidently that, you know, you, you, sometimes now you think back, it's like, how could, because that's the slogan of the Bild Zeitung, and it, but it was retaken by everybody, and it was so rooted in a debate, even though it was never part of the discussion to say that you take something that's functioning and you take it out and destroy it. Um, and the second point that we realized is that the question of affordability even though we have you know, up to 70% of a subsidy, um, you have to make it more concrete and speak about the sums, et cetera. So I think the, um, ensuring that everybody knows it's affordable for everybody, that everybody can be part of it, and that, of course, we do not stop anything that is running. Um, these are key parts. And then it has to be uh, only done when you had a debate and much more information. We also realized in Germany that people had the impression that heat bump is like flying to the moon, a very new technology. Um, and we only too late realized we should just say, you know, it's like an, a fridge, it's like an air conditioning just the other way around. And it's not a new technology. Um, but we, you know, probably we have to be much more careful about what is the understanding and knowledge. Because if it's not there, it will be the fake news, the lies that take over. So there are a few conditions that we need and need to do it better. Uh, but I think the option to say we don't do it and leave it to the next generation is not fair. I agree. <laughs> the easy answer in theory uh, for governments, whatever their exact green agenda is, but committed to this transition, is we know how it works. We should do the strong push on go fast, and at the same time, accompany people with social measure, measures, subsidies, differ, differing from one topic to another. For instance, in France, what we have, I was discussing this with the transport minister of Germany uh, for lunch. We have an ambition to have 2 million electric cars in the country by the end of the decade produced and sold and beyond in terms of sales. And we are helping people with direct subsidy when they are middle classes or poor households to buy an electric car. Even with this level of support from the government, which is 7,000 per car, it's not small, it is still very expensive and the concern is still there. So we know the, the kind of balance we should get, go fast and have a social measure, a social fund, a social accompaniment. But in practice, we know it's difficult. And I don't want, again, to sound naive, but as governments in France, Germany, elsewhere, we will have this type of moments, the discussions you had in government, in parliament, in the public debates on the boilers, and the problems we had with yellow vests on a carbon tax. We will, let's be blunt, fail sometimes, not meaning that we are not right, but failing in implementation of some measures. But the consequence or the lesson we should draw for that is that we should not abandon, we should do it differently, not ignoring people and ignoring protests, because it says something even when it's violent protests, it's, it's not acceptable in a democracy, but the, the Yellow Vest movements had very radical and violent parts that we 
fought with order and police, but it said something also about society. And we had to take that into account, and we postponed the carbon tax in this case. But we have not slowed down on the overall green agenda. And I know you had these difficult moments, debates on how the law should be in the end voted, but you did vote a law and you will go on with other types of measures. So let's be again pragmatic. The lessons we should draw from the sensitive issues or moments we are facing should not be that we should not try again and go on with maybe better measures, better balance, better pace, for sure. We have this debate, for instance, in France on what we call ZFE in our language, so the low emission zones in city centers, as in many countries. I know there is also a very strong debate in the UK, for instance. We have this strong debate, a bit less now, about uh, the, the schedule, because uh, category by category, the most polluting cars will be excluded from city centers. And of course, the narrative is very simple from the opponents. They say, it is very unfair because you are dependent on the car. You live in the suburbs, you live in a rural area, 80 kilometers from Paris. You cannot go in the city center of Paris. If you're more rich, you live in the city center, you have a bike, you have public transport, you don't need all that, you're very happy, and you exclude the others. And this is a real concern. But we said we will keep that, and we will give a bit more flexibility to the local district to decide on the pace the trajectory and on a semi-optimistic note we also have the most difficult moment probably to go through at the period we are living in in 10 years i think it will be a bit more easy on all these transformations because now for instance take the electric car but it will be the case in a lot of transformations from heating to housing isolation and so on in 10 years, you will have a bigger production of electric cars in France, in Germany, or across Europe. Price will necessarily go down because the production will increase and it will be the new normal, hence the importance of the 2035 targets to keep this market signal. And we will have a second-hand market. So what is now a luxury good, as the smartphone was, as electricity was at the very beginning, as heating was a century ago and so on, will become the new normal. The transition, the transition phase is always the most difficult from a political and strategic point of view. And we are probably in this very moment when we have to change our heatings, do isolation in our flats or houses, buy new cars, which are very expensive, and so on and so forth. Of course, there are always challenges. So in 10 years, I don't know what they will be. They will, do, they will exist for sure. But probably now, this transition from fossil fuels to low carbon or zero carbon energy and production is probably the hottest moment. And we have to stay uh, aligned and determined, listening to the problems and adapting sometimes. It's not a disaster to adapt, to drop a measure, to take another one, and remain for us as EU countries committed to the EU level, not just because it's a religion of being uh, pro-European. Uh, it's not an illness, it's not a religion, uh, but it's a necessity. Because if we have our own green deals, of course, we don't have exactly the same measures between our governments, our countries. But if we don't have the same framework, for sure, we will not succeed. And for sure, I don't know what the name will be, but we will have yellow vests, protests, and ineffectiveness. So we should keep this balance. Okay, so uh, I think uh, what I picked out from this is that Slowing down is not really an option, and uh, I think if we look at the, what's uh, happening with uh, the climate change already and the negative impact, we're seeing that uh, that uh, makes a lot of sense. But we have to be smart about how we do it, and we need to ensure that it's kind of a, a fair transition. And at the at the end, uh, you mentioned the European level, and so I was wondering whether France and Germany need to do a little bit more to help other countries in in the EU to ensure this fair transition. So. Uh, budgets are already tight in France and Germany, but if uh, you look to other countries, um, Romania, for instance, they might have a much harder time to compensate people uh, for, for hardships that comes with the transition. Um, or the, the, um, the subsidy scheme for EVs might be something that uh, countries in the EU that don't have this uh, fiscal space aren't able to do. So uh, do you think Germany and France can do or should do more and push for having potentially bigger European funding pots for these kind of things? 
Uh, yes, for sure, we will need this European solidarity, and probably we don't have, I will be very French, Veronica, don't worry again, we don't have uh, enough uh, common fiscal space uh, at the EU level or common instruments to do this. Uh, so there will be a discussion on the level of the budget, the composition of the budget, and so on. But for sure, on the transfers, it's a traditional quasi-religious debate between France and Germany and others, but it's a reality that transfers already exist through the EU budgets. Should we put them more on green transition? Most likely. Should we discuss on the size of the transfers? Most likely. But yes, it will be needed. The internal market is also playing a big role, because if we have a European car industry and with some level of level playing field with other players as well, China for instance, uh, we will facilitate also the transition in the poorest countries or uh, countries which are lagging behind. We should also accept beyond the money itself, and we have did it, we have done it, sorry, and we need this flexibility to have slightly different trajectories. Uh, I remember the European summit when it was decided to have the 2050 targets. Sometimes we say we are quite slow at the EU level, it may happen, but it was December 2019, it was decided just to have the target. Green Deal was just a piece of paper on Ursula von der Leyen's table. Uh, but at the European Council, it was decided to have the 2050 targets. This was the first step, and then we came with the Green Deal with a lot of targets, and now measures, and social funding, and so on. So it is making progress. But we have different trajectories for different countries. During this summit, Poland said, guys, I cannot do 2050. You may say this is because the uh, Polish government is not the most pro-EU government. Okay, but there was a strong reason for that too, which was we are starting with a level of carbon emissions per capita and with an energy mix, which we inherited to a large extent, that does not allow us to do as fast as France, Germany, and so on. So take this into account, and we are doing it. I mean, it's uh, fair to say that Romania or Poland will not have the same ability to do the same trajectory in the same pace, at the same pace as France or Germany or uh, Sweden. So we should accept that. But it does not mean that we don't have a common framework. It doesn't mean that we don't have the same level of ambition at the end, especially 2050. You know, I, I basically agree, maybe to add two points. I think it's important that on the new emission trading scheme number two, we agree to have a climate and social fund which, by the way, was not the easiest to get through in my own government, um, to accept that idea <laughs> that we do spend that on, you know, de facto we will become net payers on emission trading schemes. Um, and, and that was quite a big step, so that part of the income coming from emissions in Germany will go to Romania. And one should not underestimate that this has already been decided. Um, so we should always be also careful of not saying it's, you know, we don't have anything. We have put up this mechanism, which, which is, is 86 billion, I think, right? Yeah, it's and a it's lot. coming in uh, 2027. It's, it's a lot of money actually coming. We're talking about big sums. And on that one, Germany and France have agreed to be de facto net payers again. So it's a second mechanism we have now introduced, which is carbon you know, carbon-based, basically, um, and helping on social sides in countries like Romania, Bulgaria, which will certainly be net receivers. Um, second point I wanted to make is that uh, um, when we speak about European solidarity, I think what the EU budget really needs to be doing next time to a large extent is to invest in joint infrastructure for the green transformation. The recovery budget of the EU under Corona was great, but it lacks the European dimension to it. It's very national focused. And we would need funding for railed projects. I know exactly which ones lack funding. Um, <laughs> for example, you know, Germany's at the heart, you have a lot of connections. And so train infrastructure is being one, digital infrastructure being another one, energy infrastructure, hydrogen, etc. So I think we really need more European funding for joint projects, which are the basis for the transformation. Great. Time is running. I have so many more questions uh, on my on my sheet, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll turn to the audience in, in a second, but I wanted to touch upon one, one additional field. Um, you both mentioned that the EU was initially designed as a 
inward looking project and a peace building project and now there's a, a shift towards a more political Europe that's also outward looking and is aware of the geopolitical realities. Um, and so I was wondering whether you could quickly touch upon uh, two aspects of this that I think are, are important. First, um, the role that Europe has to play to trigger climate action abroad in other countries, given that Europe is just a small percentage of uh, global emissions. And uh, I also wanted to uh, go into industrial policy, but I think we, we maybe we leave that for the audience, otherwise it's, it's getting a little bit uh, too big. But yeah, what's what should be Europe's plan to ensure that we don't just do uh, our homework here in Europe, but that we also enable or push other countries to reduce their carbon footprint? You know, it's basically what I said early on, is to build these new partnerships around the green uh, transformation. And, and I think that's what the EU is basically already doing. Um, and often we don't come as lecturers, but we are also taking lectures, uh, you know, lessons. When you go to some of the African countries, their energy system, when you build it up, it's immediately digital. Our German energy system is far from digital. So, you know, we, we have to be careful also then, you know, they, they come to us and like, oh, we can't learn from you, very sorry. Um, but if you want, you can learn from us and be like, okay, good idea. Or, you know, just um, in, uh, for example, Argentina, they are having this raw material project. At the same time, they have a green energy project and they want to make it a joint project and facilitate financing. And in my ministry, we have a department for raw materials. We have departments for international energy cooperation. And they come to us and say, like, come on, can you please overcome those silly silos? They don't make any sense. And I'm like, yeah, point taken. You know, you're totally right. <laughs> we should combine that and not have it in different silos. So I, I think we have to be very careful in terms of, you know, we tell them it's a lot of a cooperation in there, but that's the beauty in it. We can really make it possible. And we need a lot of private capital, capital coming as well. So I'm always trying to get our companies to invest in these markets and the energy transformation is a business i'm like energy doesn't have to be as such a subsidy business you can make money with it you need to have high investment costs but then you can make money with it and so our strategy is to de-risk the investments and then make it a profitable business and not a charity do you want to come in on this or should we open it to the no, i agree one one comment i think at the eu level we also have leverage for global diplomacy on climate. Um, we have this debate in all our countries saying, why should we do an effort? Because we are, in the case of France, just above 1% of global emissions. First, when you do EU Green Deal, you already nearly 10% of gas emissions. So it's much better in terms of impact. And you can, if you organize, if you put pressure, if you use your tools, trade and so on, bring the others to go that direction more easily than when you do it in isolation or nationally only. Uh, just to take one example, uh, last year in Montreal for aviation, we had an agreement between more than 190 countries on the target, and of course we need to check, the target of being decarbonized in aviation in 2050. And why did we reach a deal? Because we made a common position, EU plus UK, and then our G7 partners and so on, and we reached out but without a clear EU commitment that we had taken first to decarbonization of aviation, no chance that the others would have followed. So it also helps us convincing or putting pressure, depending on the situation, on the global scale. Thanks a lot. And then I think we can open it up for questions from the audience. I think there are uh, two people with microphones who can walk around. Um, let's start. Uh, with the lady in the uh, second row. And let's take two questions at a time. Um, who else? Uh, three people. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the lady over there, please, as the second person. Excuse me. Hi, hello. Is it open? Yeah, you can hear me. Hi, I'm Johanna. I'm 24 years old and I'm studying here uh, international affairs and working full time in my profession professional year at the Allianz Foundation on Climate Imperative. Um, my question goes to you first. Um, I don't know if we really can afford another failing in communication terms, also in light of the increasing right wing on the European level. And 
the second question goes to you both. What can we do uh, for the next European elections? And what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yes. So the title is The Road Towards Sustainable Growth and a Stronger Europe. Potentially, we'll see it also a larger Europe in the next five years. What do you see as both the main challenges and opportunities towards dealing with the Green Deal and meeting the targets, which are quite ambitious, considering that it's also going to be a larger Europe with a lot more financial challenges as well? Okay, let's pick one more question. Um, yeah, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Benjamin Boyle from the Centre Marc Bloch in Britain, just 200 meters away, um, where I'm co-responsible co for a uh, research focus on uh, environment, environmental questions. So I think it's, uh, first of all, really important that there are people in charge that, that are um, valuing the, the European integration project and, and want to bring it forward. So I think that's to mention first. Uh, I have many questions about limit to, to two. The first one, very broad one, um, it's a very ambitious project, the European Green Deal, um, but of course you are aware probably that it's not enough. Um, if you see the Paris Agreement, even with the Green New Deal fulfilled, it won't be enough to get on track for uh, the 1.5 till 2 degree. Um, so I was wondering what are your thoughts on that and how can we maybe... Um, uh, uh, get on track for, for uh, really full f complying with the Paris Agreement. And the second very concrete question I was wondering um, about the train connection between Paris and Berlin, uh, which I think is a very concrete, a, a, a very small but a symbolic project. And I think it's an important project. We In May 2020, it was announced that it would come uh, this year. Uh, it came right when we were uh, discussing limiting flights uh, with our institutes, which is, I think, a major uh, point to do in, in order to apply, for example, with the Paris Agreement. Now it's said that this will be end of 24, and I learned from the press that there is some dispute between France and Germany about uh, where exactly the train line will uh, run through. I was wondering, could you... I mean, it should be easy to, to solve, right, if you have two train connections where you take into consideration the two train lines which are discussed. So if you couldn't weigh in with this. Thank you. All right. Three great questions. Uh, we have the importance of communication and the importance of avoiding communication failure and uh, also the, the next election. We have the uh, opportunities and challenges uh, with the green deals and how to how to capture them. Also, against the backdrop of a EU that's going to expand, hopefully at some point. Um, and then we have the um, a question on the green deal not uh, being sufficient to reach the Paris Agreement and also the train connection. Um, yeah, I'll just leave the choice to you, and you can maybe we'll pick up some questions so that uh, we don't do. Both of us, the full answers on everything, but uh, you will recall us if we forget something sensitive. Um, just, I will start with a nice thing on the train connection. Yeah, it does, it does arrive. Uh, night train, 11th of December between Paris and Berlin. So this will be this year, hopefully. Uh, yeah. I think starting probably next week, I'm cautious, but starting next week, I think you can also already book the tickets. Um, so, Francisca, we can do that too. Uh, so, night train, Paris, Berlin, 11th of December. And the uh, day connection, direct connection, will be uh, next year. Yeah, so it's uh, late 2024, probably, a year afterwards. But the night train is starting now. Um, and we have debates on the, the route. I had it uh, with my German counterpart for lunch, but I will not go into too many details to answer other questions. We will solve it. Um, on the communication, communication failure, I think you were referring to the green transition specifically. No, um, don't misunderstand me. I was not saying we should fail. Uh, it's no matter if we fail. Uh, and I'm not saying we fail on everything. I think there will be moments which are, I don't know if it's failures, difficulties, challenges, whatever, but they will be measured as a package we have nationally and we have at the EU level, which will not go through at some points. What I say is that when it happens, it should not happen very often, but when it happens and we are in a period in which we should accept a level of uncertainty about pace, trajectory, and 
going through the Green Deal, as you said, it's probably already insufficient. So losing it is no, is no option. Uh, so if there is a blocking point, we should find other ways to make green measures as well. That's my point. Uh, the lesson we should draw from Yellow Vest or from your debates on sensitive topics like heating systems should not be that we should stop. And what do we do for European elections? I don't know if I will be uh, campaigning for that, but it's clear is that we should know, from my point of view, we should defend the Green Deal. We should defend the ambition, not every text, every paragraph. We don't really care about the technicalities. We care about the ambition. And the fact that we should know, uh, slow down, we should know, we should not abandon, there will be, I don't know the name, or the motto that will be uh, chosen, but for the next commission, the next European Parliament, there will be still a very green ambition as a priority. And we should agree on that. And as I said, I think that's the responsibility of French and German governments. We should also prepare, because we had difficulties on negotiations, which in many cases did go through after discussions, debates, but we should anticipate and prepare also from joint contributions, I think, from our governments before the new commission is in place. And uh, I just insist on that the parties, we see that to be very direct on the right-wing or center-right parties at the moment, which are running after the anti-climate stance of the far right, I think, I don't agree with the substance, but this is one point, but on tactics, I think it's a mistake, because you will never be as anti-climate as these extremist parties. So we should be not shy on Europe in general, and we should be not shy on defending the EU dimension and the ambition at the EU level of the Green Deal, I'm sure. Do you want to come in very quickly? Very quickly on enlargement, oh, okay. because I think it's a fair point. I think enlargement uh, has great opportunities for the Green Deal, energy, raw materials, lots lots of ways for cooperation within the enlarged EU then. I think that's really, uh, we should, for me, it's a big opportunity to, to, to tackle and make that a joint project. And if I may, one second on the, um, you know, no failure. Seriously, I'm like, there will be failures. Um, we will, we have to work better. We have to, you know, learn from your mistakes, do it better next time. But it is a complex process, sorry to say. This is about reworking our entire energy. It's about reworking our mobility. It's reworking our agriculture. It's a complex system. And, there you, and then it's under stress because of geopolitical tensions. So to believe that we can only get a green agenda through without any failures won't happen. We have to get better. And also we have to remember that it's a fight. There are vested interests that don't want it because they make money with the current system, a lot of money. And sometimes I think we also just have to remember this and saying, okay, there are people who just genuinely don't want this because they are very much benefiting from the current system and they don't care about what comes to the next generations. And I think to have that in your mind again makes you a bit more resilient. Um, and I think we need to be more resilient and to be accepting complexity and I agree with what Clément said, you know, in 10 years, we will be in a much better place. This is not forever. You know, once you've switched your heating system, you have switched it. Once you've changed your energy, you have changed it. It's not for the next generations. It's for us now to do it. Um, and I think that's also important to have in mind. There's an end point to it. It's not forever. Great. Uh, let's have three more questions and please keep the questions as concise as possible. Um, the lady in the red jacket, please, um, over there. Uh, and to make it easy, the gentleman in the gray t-shirt after that, and then gentleman in the white shirt. First, thank you so much for this discussion. We appreciate it. And uh, my question is, uh, you said that EU will try to build a new supply chains. And I presume some of these supply chains will be set up with autocratic, non-democratic regimes. How do you want to ensure that EU will not fall into dependence of autocratic, uh, non-democratic regimes? And how does EU want to get out of uh, dependence of current uh, supply chains that are set up with autocratic regimes? Because some of the raw materials uh, we cannot get from, uh, non, uh, from democratic regimes. I mean. Great, you. could you pass the microphone? Yes. 
Um, thank you, Minister Bone. Thank you, Dr. Brantner, for your keynote addresses. addresses. Um, just to bounce back on two of the questions that were asked before. Um, yes, I heard the news about the um, night train between Berlin and Paris. Um, I'm from France, I'm from Brittany. Um, if I want to take a train from here to, 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 to Quimper, where I'm from, uh, it's going to cost me between 200 and 300 euros. Uh, whereas if I want to fly from here to Nantes and then take a train to Quimper, this is going to cost just under 100 euros. Um, so I wanted to know if you wanted to expand on that and also how much of that pertains to a uh, communication failure. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Uh, hello. Um, my question would join uh, the first person's questions um, regarding the external uh, facade of the uh, European policy, energy policy. Uh, entering to this room, there was uh, flyers that were being um, distributed regarding the European uh, answer to the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the American law. And uh, Frau Pratner talked about um, China. And actually, there is um, some kind of racial uh, um, liquidation in Euro-Asia in uh, between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenian. Uh, and the bond between Armenia and the European, uh, Azerbaijan and the European Union is highly important regarding the um, gas uh, contracts. And you mentioned China twice, um, but China actually is rolling out um, spectacular uh, renewable energy technologies and is doing great in terms of uh, transition and in terms of uh, critical raw materials they have some kind of upper hand are we considering uh, are we in a legitimate position to go into a, a diplomatic clash if you can say this with China and on the other room, we have the elephant in the room. And on, on, on the other hand, we have the elephant in the room, which is the USA, which is having the IRA Act and um, competing very, and threatening our competitivity as European technologies in terms of green um, technologies. Thank you. So I uh, think is um, my question to be to, to, towards, it's about our position regarding our external relationship with the world because the Green Act is the leading, is leading everywhere. Thank you. It. So for your questions, um, because I have to leave very sharp. Um, first on the raw materials, I'm like, if we already do it with the friends we have, you know, Canada, Australia, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, these are all South Africa, hugely resource, resource rich countries. Um, you know, and then you can still talk about Congo. But the problem today is that all of these countries, when they extract, it goes 100% to China and then it comes back to us. Um, and so we have a big opportunity to work with our partners. They are all democracies. They are all our friends. We have just left them aside for the last couple of decades. And then, you know, yes, there are a few countries that are more difficult, but basically, if we finally wake up, we work with the most democratic countries and partners that we have. Um, second part, uh, we do diversify hopefully more than we have just one. Um, that's what we're doing also on hydrogen. On China, you know, I think there will be much more need for raw materials if we do have a greening of Africa, Latin America, all the regions, we will need so many raw materials. It's not a zero-sum game. What we have to focus on is that we're not dependent, like today, 100% on some of these refined materials. 100% dependency is just not smart. Um, you know, on gas, it was just above 50%, and you've seen how much it have, has cost us 200 you know, billion um, over the last year and a half. It's crazy. And that was just over 50%. So now you have some of these, you're 100%. It's not smart. Independent of whatever country it would be, it's not a smart strategy. Uh, and the, la the market gets larger, so there will be, it's not a zero-sum game. It's enlarging the cake. And uh, we just have to watch out that our friends, like Canada, Australia, will be part of that cake. 
And I think that's in our interest and our values. Um, on the night train, yes, we have to work on affordable traffic. That's why we did the 49 euro tickets. Um, and I remember on that uh, night train between Paris and Berlin, I think I started the first, you know, uh, petition for that like five years ago. Um, and I think many people from the Bloch were now back signed at the time. Um, and then we got it onto the Maßnahmen list, the measure list of the new Elysee Treaty, the aix en la chapelle Treaty, and now we're getting there. So it's step by step. Um, and I remember at the time, you know, you had like, uh, I don't know, it was in the end, it was 30,000 people signing up for that uh, petition. But they were all German, French, and in that, you know, situation that they actually would love to travel in a, uh, in a safe, uh, sustainable, and hopefully cheap way between Paris and uh, Berlin. By the way, I used to travel by bus. That was a nightmare. Uh, but <laughs> when Flux I was that, that generation, bad. that was not so nice. But uh, thanks for having us. I'm sorry I have to leave. <laughs> uh, okay, then uh, yeah, please join me in thanking uh, both panelists. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit sorry that uh, we didn't get uh, more questions in, uh, but perhaps uh, you'd be willing to stay three more minutes with us and uh, react and to perhaps uh, give a sort of yeah, a, your I mean, concluding remarks. Francisca said a lot about these answers, uh, you know, with these questions in her answers, uh, which I share, just maybe on the dependency issue, which is, of course, critical, which is not only on energy, but basically in our trade and everyday life in general, because everything we do, everything we wear and so on, has a level of dependency to systems or countries we may not like for different reasons, from political regime to uh, climate policy and so on. Uh, Green transition in this respect, depending on how we do it, is an opportunity because the dependency is a current reality. Fossil fuels, gas, oil is high dependency on countries which are either unstable or undemocratic or a mix of both and so on and so forth. Not all of them. As Francisca said, we can do better with friends and allies with the same products. But moving to green, electricity, renewables, and or nuclear, depending on the choice. Uh, hydrogen to some extent, but we have to be careful. Uh, we, can, we will be less dependent because a lot of this energy will be produced internally. Of course, it's not 100% easy and not 100% possible as such, because even when you build um, a solar panel, they come from China at the moment. When you have uh, windmills, they are coming uh, with part of the components from outside the EU for sure. But we can produce and do better and the green transition is also a reducing of our dependency for real. Um, just to say on the raw material specific issue, this is probably one of the most difficult because we are dependent de facto on the rest of the world, but we can do better here again internally or externally with friends, allies, anticipating the value chains, diversifying them and so on. But we have some resources in our countries to some extent, but we have debates. I don't want to open more windows or doors, but for instance, in France, we have a debate about mining. We have some resources. We would not be fully independent in this respect, but we can produce a bit of lithium. Should we do it? Is it better to have some environmental impact that we will mitigate, but still in our country, or to import it entirely from countries we don't like so much? This, uh, our answer at the moment is we should do our parts with local production and domestic production. But none of these debates are easy. But for, to put it simply, I think the green transition is a huge geopolitical and geostrategic opportunity to reduce our dependency amongst other benefits from the green transition. That's for sure. Just on the train prices, I um, don't want to be too long because uh, that's a, a debate which comes back in all discussions, legitimately, and I, I, I can be very long on that. But. Uh, we have to recall not to justify the price you pay to go back to Brittany, uh, but to understand why it is more expensive initially. It's not, it's not just because the plane has some advantages, like kerosene is not taxed. Um, it's mainly because structurally the train is more expensive. Structurally the train is more expensive because between two stations you have infrastructure. Between two airports you have no infrastructure. No, but that's the reality, the economic reality, if the market is doing it itself. The market is not, not doing it itself. That's why in Germany, in France, in all EU countries, on average, the ticket you buy, which remains expensive, but the ticket you buy is 70 to 80% subsidized. 
by your city, your region, your government, wherever. In France, it's more like 80 in av on average. So we should do better. And there are ways to do better. First, to buy more trains. It's very simple. But in France, uh, if you take a high-speed train, for instance, it's expensive because it's packed. So if we buy more trains, it's market leverage in a way, or subsidized leverage to get the prices down. In some respects, competition. I think we should have this debate. In France, we opened competition on Paris-Lyon train line, minus 10% in the prices. I'm not saying we should do it everywhere because, of course, competition is not applicable to all lines, but it can help on high-speed lines, which are highly competitive. And sometimes targeted products and more subsidies, especially for the young people. The 49 euro ticket in Germany is a higher level of subsidies given by the government and the lender. Very good. We are inspired by this, as I said, and working on the same. This summer, I decided on the budget of my ministry to divide by two the price of night train and day train for what we call intercité, the Cora, if some uh, French people are here or travel to France. Um, now it's intercité, it's more chic, but it's basically the same, and sometimes the same trains. Uh, so we are buying new trains uh, also, and we need money for that, so you need to pay a bit, but we are reducing the prices. And we need, I don't want to be far too long, but we need to target also. Do we do it for the young people or just for everybody? I think it's legitimate to doing for the young generation in particular, but everyone has a right to do green mobility. Uh, do we do it on all lines? I decided that we will not change the TGV funding system because TGV is not subsidized. So you pay the real prices, if I may say, because we always invest a lot in TGV in France, which is great, and we love it, like Germany in ICE, but we have abundant to some uh, extent uh, national intercity lines, which are just as important and carry more people. So I prefer to put my public money from my ministry on this, because otherwise, going back to the fairness of the green transition, people will say, TGV expensive, true, but who is taking TGV? 50% higher classes, higher households, because it's expensive, true, but also because it is connecting big metropole, big uh, cities. Uh, if we lose the night trains, if we lose the intercity train or this type of regional trains or national trains, non-high speed, we will give more despair to people which are already dependent on the car, have no train mobility and so on. So we also have to make priorities. This is a priority. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was a great... Uh way to to end our uh, discussion thanks a lot thanks a lot uh, for coming uh, again my apologies that i didn't get uh, more questions in uh, these types of events you always uh, hope you had more time but uh, yeah thanks a lot for coming and have a nice evening merci beaucoup